So welcome to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Science Cafe. We're so happy to have everyone here tonight, including our virtual audience at a, a Tavern on the Wharf in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And now we're gonna be introducing our speaker, Carolyn Teepole. She is a scientist in our biology department, an evolutionary oceanographer. Um, before coming to Hui, she got her PhD at Stanford University, and then she hiked the Pacific Crest Trail shortly after, <laughs> and then did her PhD in biodiversity genomics at the Smithsonian Institution. Her research program is focused on understanding how marine species adapt to changing environments on timescales of decades to centuries. She works extensively with marine invasive species and integrates approaches from genomics, ecology, and physiology. So thank you, Carolyn, welcome. And here you go. Oh, I've, I've got the mic, yep, <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> so thank you, Danielle, for that great introduction. I'll, hopefully I won't blow people away with the volume here. Uh, and thank you all for taking time uh, in person or online to come and hear a little bit more about what I do at Hui. Uh, and as Danielle said, what I do at Hui is primarily focused on understanding how marine animals can adapt to really fast changes in their environments, um, mm -hmm. the kind of changes that are particularly important in the world and the ocean as it's changing now. Um, and I do this often by looking at invasive species. So we're gonna start by talking about invasions and we're gonna kind of work our way up to body snatching. So, this is sort of a rogues gallery of invasive species that you may have seen or heard of in the news. Invasive species being just a species that gets moved from the place where it evolved and it's been for millennia to a new environment through hu human means, uh, intentionally or unintentionally. And usually uh, by the time we call something invasive, that means it's becoming a big problem for humans. Uh, so things that we intentionally move around like cows for agriculture, we wouldn't consider invasive. So this sort of rogues gallery, we've got um, kind of in the middle, uh, your left, zebra mussels, which you've probably heard of in the Great Lakes. They came in and they coat every structure under the waterline pretty much. They fill pipes and they cause uh, huge amounts of uh, costs and damages. Uh, zebra fish are down on the bottom left. Uh, that's another one you've probably heard of. They were introduced to the Caribbean and they are really great at eating everything smaller than they are. Uh, so they've had some big impacts on the reefs there. A couple other uh, less watery examples. Rats are one of the ultimate invasive species, one of the originals, because as long as people have been traveling around on boats, uh, rats have been traveling with us. Obviously uh, not an intentional introduction. And starlings are just one more to mention the bird here, which I think is kind of fascinating. This is an intentional introduction. Uh, we have starlings because some gentleman in the late 1800s decided that what he really wanted to do was introduce to Central Park in New York all of the birds mentioned in the plays of Shakespeare. And most of them didn't take off, but starlings did. So there's estimated to be over 50,000 invasive species in the United States. We care about them for a number of reasons I've kind of already mentioned, one of which is that they can have some huge economic consequences. It's estimated, and this is actually an old estimate right now, uh, that they cause about $120 billion worth of uh, costs annually in the US. So that's things like scraping zebra mussels uh, off of the bottoms of uh, ships and piers and replacing pipes. Um, things like scraping invasive fouling species off ships or they'll slow them down, uh, all kinds of things. Lots of agriculture and aquaculture, uh, agriculture and aquaculture pests as well. And they're also an ecological threat. So it's estimated that uh, around 40% of endangered species are one of the primary threats to them are invasive species. Um, sort of a related example that I think is kind of fascinating with the zebra, or the lionfish rather, uh, recently, there was a paper that came out that described a couple new species of small reef fish from the Caribbean. And these fish would have never been described by science before. They weren't described by catching them on the reef. They were described because they were found in a zebra fish's, or a lionfish's stomach. So these lionfish were eating species that we didn't even know were there. Um, and invasive species are 
really fascinating to me because they're this opportunity to look at both how these species come into a new environment and how they have to change in response to it and how that environment has to change in response to the invasive species. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is kind of a special class of invasive species and one that doesn't get uh, anywhere near as much airplay, and that's parasites. So all these species that are coming in from other places they all have parasites, potentially. And while it's a little bit harder for a parasite to become established than a free-living animal, it's not impossible. And part of my research is looking at uh, basically what happens when these marine invasive parasites come in and what can native species do to deal with this. So just a quick uh, parasite question. I have another poll now that Danielle has warmed everybody up to participate. Uh, if people can raise their hands, and I'll give you some options for what proportion of species on Earth do you think are parasites? And these, uh, we're going to leave aside the bacteria for now. And by parasite, I just mean a species that exists, has a relationship with another species that it needs to survive, and it's not reciprocal. The parasite takes, but the host doesn't get anything back. It just gives. So these are your options. So can I have a show of hands? Anyone think uh, about 1% of species are parasites? Okay, you all are far too smart for this. How about 15%? How about 50%, one in two species? Yeah. Oh, Dad, you should have had your hand up for that one. Because <laughs> the answer is 50%. Uh, it's estimated that half of all the multicellular species on Earth are actually parasites, which is, is kind of astonishing when you think about it, but makes a little more sense when you think about how many ways there are, essentially, to be a parasite. So. I mean, I have parasites, you all probably have parasites, not as many as our ancestors did, so we're definitely making progress there. Uh, people in Facebook, you probably also have parasites. Our pets have parasites, our plants have parasites. Um, it's an apple tree, which is one of the many hosts for mistletoe. Mistletoe is actually a plant parasite, uh, so it infects a number of trees, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about how it's become a romantic symbol in the meantime. Uh, and finally, even parasites can have parasites. So if you're looking for a vocabulary word of the day, the parasites that parasitize other parasites are called hyperparasites. <laughs> it, I, that's like my favorite biology term. I love it. <laughs> and uh, apparently, we've been thinking about hyperparasites for a while. So there's actually a little piece of poetry um, from Jonathan Swift from the 1700s. Uh, so naturalists observe a flea has smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller still to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum, which I think is pretty impressive. And of course, living in the 18th century, I'm guessing that Jonathan Swift knew what he was talking about, because he was full of parasites, I'm sure. <laughs> but of course, we're here for Huey, not, not necessarily just to talk about Jonathan Swift's parasites, as interesting as I'm sure they are, uh, we're here to talk about the ocean, and which is this just amazing ecosystem. It's full of a tremendous amount of evolutionary novelty, um, a huge amount of life. It's vital to everything we do, and it's full of parasites also. These are just a couple of the more uh, charismatic and interesting marine parasites. Um, just one really quick one. I love, if you see that cute little Nemo up in the right-hand uh, corner, Look in his mouth, and you'll see another face. So that is a parasitic isopod. Uh, they're related to those little roly-poly bugs that you find under logs and stuff. Um, they're actually crustaceans. They uh, attach to the base of the tongue of the fish, and the tongue atrophies. The little isopod just sits in there, acts as its tongue, and just eats a little bit of food along with the fish. So nature has come up with a lot of really horrifying ways to survive. <laughs> Um, and so that's really what my interest is in. Uh, these marine parasites, we know they play an important role in marine communities, but what happens when they invade? And what kind of mechanisms do hosts have to adapt to new parasites that come in? So what are the ecological and evolutionary consequences of this kind of parasitism? So now we get to talk about body snatchers. Um, this, I love putting this talk together because um, <laughs> I, I, you will see this slide a few more times because this is like my favorite slide ever. <laughs> but body snatcher is a term in parasitology. It just refers to a 
type of parasite based on its lifestyle and what it does. So these are parasites that castrate their hosts. So they don't kill them, but they take the host's reproductive energy and shuttle it towards the parasite's own reproduction. So if you want to be dramatic about it, uh, sometimes I'll say that it's almost like turning the host into a sort of zombie nursemaid for the parasite. And to do this, to achieve its kind of reproductive ends, these parasites often change the host's behavior, sometimes its size, and even its shape. So they can have these really big impacts on their hosts. And of course, as an evolutionary biologist, the fact that they castrate their hosts uh, is particularly interesting to me, uh, excuse me, because it takes them out of the gene pool. So it's a really strong selective pressure. Uh, the particular uh, parasite or body snatcher that I'm interested in is a marine one. They come in both marine and terrestrial flavors. Uh, and this is a parasitic barnacle. So this group is called a rhizocephalin. Uh, and just to show you, on the right is a etching that I really love from over 100 years ago showing the barnacles. So you probably see at the bottom some of these nice round encrusting barnacles like you've probably seen on rocks uh, just right out there, I'm sure. Uh, up at the top, you have some gooseneck barnacles. The things that look like they're from a science fiction nightmare at the very top and bottom in the middle are actually uh, barnacles with the shells taken off, so you can see the insides. And then in the middle is a crab, right, which is not a barnacle, but which, a, which is a host for rhizocephalins. They're crustaceans that infect other crustaceans. They infect uh, crabs, lobsters, shrimps, those kinds of animals. Um, and they're what we call highly derived, uh, which in biology just means they don't look anything like any other barnacles. Uh, the only time they look like other barnacles is when they're really young. So this is what they look like when they first hatch out. This is, believe it or not, what a barnacle looks like uh, when it's first born. So they start out as these little nauplius larvae. They're the ones on the top. Uh, the little black thing is an eye spot. I think they're actually really cute. You can watch them zoom in around under a microscope. Um, and they eventually go through a couple molts and they turn into these little cyprids with their cute little antennule like hand uh, antennules that look like little hands in front. Um, so this is what they look like as adults just to blow that picture up to show you and what you probably notice right away if you're looking for a parasite is that big sac underneath the crab's abdomen and that is part of the uh, parasite but what you might not have noticed is all of those little black tendrils running through the crab that's also the parasite tissue. So the way that this parasite makes its living is uh, that cute little cyprid with the eye spot that I showed you from the previous slide comes up to a crab that's newly molted, so it's nice and it's soft and vulnerable, injects itself into the crab, wriggles around in the crab in the middle, and then starts to grow little tendrils all through the circulatory system of the crab or whatever host you're talking about here. Um, and it becomes really entwined with the host tissue. It's kind of a, a bizarre parasite for that reason. After it has a nice network and it's ready to reproduce, the next time the crab molts, and again, it's nice and soft, the parasite pokes a little stalk out from underneath the crab's abdomen with a little kind of sac at the end, and that's the reproductive structure for the parasite. And I should back up now and tell you that everything I told you about the parasite infecting the crab and the stalk that's all the female parasite. So they have sexes, they're male and female. The female does all of that. Uh, the male's entire purpose is basically to come around and sort of um, become sort of a sac of sperm in that uh, reproductive structure, fertilize it, and then it swells up. It gets to be big enough to see it on the crab the way that you can here. You can see these with your naked eye, they're really big. Um, and then every X number of days, through that little pore at the bottom, the parasite will pump out, that sac will pump out thousands and thousands of new parasite larvae. So it's kind of an astonishing and horrifying way to make your living, I think, but really fascinating. Um, and and for, for those who are wondering, these parasites are very picky. They really only infect uh, crustaceans and only specific ones. So there is, as far as I know, not a human equivalent. Uh, so <laughs> they're not going to come after you, don't worry. Um, so, uh, and also just a little uh, side note, which I think is neat, is that rhizocephalin is from Greek for root head, and that's because of all that little structure of tendrils that goes through the crab. Now, these parasites, given how kind of intimately entwined they are with the host, 
you might expect that they have a lot of impacts on the host, uh, which they do. They change the host's behavior, and they even feminize male crabs. They infect both males and females. So I have a quick uh, diversion. So uh, if nothing else from this evening, if you don't know how to tell a male and a female crab apart, uh, I'm going to tell you right now. So a female crab, if you look at her abdomen, which is tucked up against the bottom of her body, she uh, looks like the capital dome. Nice and wide and shield-shaped, and that's because she holds eggs there uh, and broods them for weeks or months um, and takes care of them. She's a pretty good mother. The male, on the other hand, he's pretty indifferent. After uh, he fertilizes things, he's sort of out of the picture, so he has the Washington Monument instead. Now, crabs that have been infected for a while after a couple molts, that Washington Monument on the infected males will broaden and broaden and broaden and look more and more like the Capitol Dome. So this is a, a picture from an older paper. Uh, on the far left, that's a male with no parasite. And then those two on the right are males that have the parasites. You can see how dramatic that is. And in fact, when we have them in the lab, crabs that have been parasitized for quite a while, we can't tell the difference between male and female anymore. In addition to changing how they look, the parasite also changes how they act. So I told you these female crabs have their eggs under their abdomen. They're good mothers. Um, they'll make sure that they're clean, that they're aerated, that they have what they need to develop. And even if you, if you kind of pick up a crab that's brooding, she'll often put her legs in front of her eggs to uh, try to protect them. Parasitized crabs will do the same thing for their parasites. Uh, effectively, that sort of maternal behavior is turned on, even in male crabs that are normally totally uninvolved in that aspect of the project or that aspect of the, the whole process of reproduction. So I kind of like to say that it's, uh, it's like you're taking the Tom Brady of crabs and turning him into Carol Brady when you're <laughs> parasitizing them. And I should say, my mom's a Pats fan. She told me it was OK to use that joke. So <laughs> thanks, mom. <laughs> And there are over 260 different species of rhizocephalin. As I said, they infect crabs, lobsters, shrimps, hermit crabs, uh, including important species. This is an adult that you're looking at here. Uh, you can see my, my uh, colleague's manicure getting ruined in pursuit of science to give you some scale. So these are really tiny guys. Uh, the parasite in particular is Loxothylacus panopii. We call it Loxo for short. It doesn't really have a common name. Uh, and then the crab, it infects two different species of these little estuarine mud crabs. And the one that I'm particularly interested in this, is this guy, the white-fingered mud crab, or Rithropinopius harrisi, or Rithro for short. Um, and on this picture, you can see, like I said, this is an adult crab. So they're quite small. They're about the size of your thumbnail. They're really common in estuaries uh, all along the coasts. You just probably haven't seen them because they're small and brown and live in the mud. But they're actually an important part of the food web, and they're quite common. Um, in this one, you can see those. I don't have a good pointer, but if you can see, it has at least four different sacs uh, under its abdomen. And those are the parasite. And from previous genetic work, we know that each one of those sacs is a different individual parasite. So that one crustacean the size of your thumbnail is actually uh, hosting at least four other crustaceans. Uh, and I say at least because we actually found another species of uh, crustacean parasite in the, con in the course of this work and one of my interns did. So there might be more in there. Um, now, this guy is really interesting to me uh, because of the range of the parasite and the host in their history. So the host, this little mud crab, is super widespread, Gulf of Maine, all the way through the Gulf of Mexico. But the parasite, historically, has only been in the southern part of this range, uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, just up to Cape Canaveral, we think, in Florida. And that was all well and good. We had some of these crabs that had evolved with the parasite over a long period of time, and some of these crabs that were naive, populations that had never seen the parasite before. And that was how it went until 1964, when the parasite was first found in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, as a side note, we think how it got there was that the 
kind of decade before this, uh, there were a bunch of big diseases that ripped through the oyster populations in the Chesapeake, and so they were trying really hard to rebuild oyster populations, bringing in healthy oyster stocks from places like the Gulf of Mexico. And what we think probably happened was in with these oysters, these little crabs, they're tiny, uh, lots of things like to eat them, so they like to hide in oyster beds. So we think it probably brought along some uh, crabs, and some of those crabs were parasitized, and the parasite got out in the population in the Chesapeake. Uh, now, that paper in the 60s originally said, you know, we found this, we know it wasn't here before, but, you know, winter is different in Maryland than it is in, like, Louisiana, so we think it's probably not going to survive, right? It's probably going to be too cold. So, by 1983, it was all through the Chesapeake and down to North Carolina, so the parasite clearly didn't read that paper. Uh, by 2004, it was down to Georgia. By 2006, it had made it down to Florida, basically meeting Cape Canaveral, that edge of the range. And there was kind of a weirdo introduction in 2012. A little population was found right in Long Island Sound that we think uh, didn't, didn't spread continuously, but kind of jumped there, was introduced again. And that possibly is also to do with oyster restoration efforts. We're not totally sure. That one doesn't seem to be spreading, but we're not quite sure yet. So I'm really interested in how things can change over time. And if you want to know, for example, how does the host adapt to the parasite over time, right? Um, and how long does, what does that process look like and how fast uh, can it go? There's one kind of methodologically really uh, simple way to do it. Uh, really neat and convenient, but unfortunately um, it is uh, infrastructure-wise not yet possible. I uh, would really love this. <laughs> so since we don't have a time machine, uh, instead I can use this invasion and I can substitute space for time and look at what happens in these different areas. So look at what's going on in this relationship between the parasite and the host, where they've had millennia to come to terms with each other down in the native range of the parasite. I can see what happens uh, with the crabs when they've never seen the parasite before, like up here in New England, and I can see what happens when the crab and the parasite have had sort of 10 to 50 years to get to know each other. So I looked at uh, nine study sites, and I'm going to be telling you about three in each of those areas, and unfortunately when I uh, redid my slides, apparently the stars didn't transfer. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about this work. First, uh, some field surveys. So the first thing we wanted to know was, um, are there more parasites in the crab populations that haven't seen the parasite for as long? So where the parasite has invaded, is it hitting those populations harder? So we went and did some field surveys that I'll tell you about. Then we did some lab experiments. So for the lab, we really wanted to know um, when we hold all the conditions the same, when we infect the crabs with uh, parasites under controlled conditions, are some populations more susceptible and some less? So we would think that maybe if those crabs that have evolved with the parasite um, have evolved resistance to being parasitized, that they might be much less likely to be infected than crabs that have never seen the parasite before. And I'm going to touch very, very briefly on some of the stuff I'm working on now, which is actually looking at the genetic basis of this. So what is parasitism and this kind of potential adaptation uh, doing in the crab's genomes? So the first question is the science road trip with the really simple question, are there more parasites where the parasite has invaded? Uh, so we went to nine different estuaries. These are my interns from that summer, Connor and Darren, who probably never want to see another crab again in their entire lives. Uh, they were fantastic. Um, and what we do, since these crabs don't really come to baited traps and we wanted a better representation of the population anyway, is we actually set out these uh, crab condos, we call them. So they're these, it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment right here. Uh, yeah, a dollar and a half at Home Depot. Um, we fill these up with oyster shell and we put a little mesh cover on and we drop them down off docks and just sit them on the bottom in muddy areas of estuaries for about two months. And what happens is these crabs, as I said, they really like shelter because everything wants to eat them, so they like to hide. Uh, so we're basically putting like luxury uh, high-rise crab accommodation down there. And they take the bait, and they come, they move in, and then two months later, we very rudely pull their nice homes up, uh, dump them out into sieves, and then pick every little crab out of the oyster shell with tweezers uh, down to two millimeters, which is like, it, it's terribly small. I still see little crabs in my sleep from doing this <laughs> so much. Um, 
And then we're able to ask how many crabs are parasitized and a lot of other information on the populations, like how many crabs are they, how, big are the, how many crabs are there, how big are they, um, and those kinds of things. So I'm gonna just quickly take you on a little road trip. We actually did road trip this uh, three times to put these out and get data, and that's because we just were going to remote places and we had a lot of equipment, so the best way to get there. So we started here in the native range uh, of the parasite, and that little red line is that sort of invisible demarcation line between where the parasite's native and where the parasite's invasive. Uh, and I'm gonna just show you a quick picture from each of those sites uh, with a little pie chart chart showing you the prevalence of the parasites. You can kind of follow along with us. So we started in Point of Chen, Louisiana, um, where we found about 1% of the mud crabs were infected. Uh, pretty low, but about uh, on par with expectations. Um, and as, as a side note, I was born and bred in New Hampshire, and working in August in southern Louisiana was a real uh, redefinition of summer for me. It was very exciting. <laughs> um, oh, it's so hot. <laughs> So then we moved on to Apalachicola Bay in Florida. This is still on the Gulf Coast. We actually didn't find any parasites in the crabs that we were studying, uh, but we did find them in the other species that infect. So we know that the parasite was there, it is just rare. And finally, we went to uh, the Atlantic coast of Florida, south of Cape Canaveral. We didn't find any parasites at all, and as a, a little side note, I'm not honestly positive that that's actually the native range of the parasite, but that's what people say. Um, next step kind of cross that invisible line of Cape Canaveral, move up, we found kind of zero to 1% parasitism, really low rates in the native range. What does it look like where the parasite is invasive? And it's only been there for 10 to 50 years. Uh, so the first place we went, just two hours north of that last site with no parasites, Pelissier Creek, which is near St. Augustine in Florida, and about 20% of crabs were infected. It was much, much higher there. Um, Moving on to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, we found about 8% of crabs infected, but one of our sampling dates was kind of messed up because there was a huge flood that just ripped through the southeast right before we sampled. So I think it's probably a little bit higher than that. Um, as a side note, if you think that biology is super glamorous, this is our lovely sampling site under an active railway trestle. Um, there were also alligators. So <laughs> that was my interns. I told them that their primary job was to make sure that like they spotted alligators and let me know, because as I said, I grew up in New England. I didn't want an unexpected alligator situation to arise. They did a very good job. Um, and then we moved up to Chesapeake Bay, where it all started, where about 40% of crabs were infected up in the Chesapeake. And I should say this project in the Chesapeake um, is done with the help of a lot of um, uh, citizen scientists and volunteers who do this ongoing monitoring for the parasite. Uh, so these uh, lovely people, including two high school students, actually just came out to help us hunt crabs and parasites uh, out of the goodness of their hearts. So we see that these rates in the invasive range are much, much higher uh, than we were seeing in the native range. Uh, and the last thing I did, I'm just going to show you quickly, I went up past this other invisible line up to sites where the parasite has never been. We've never seen it recorded. And we went up here partly to get samples for the next stage of the experiment, uh, partly just to see you know, how many crabs are there, um, uh, how big are they, what does that look like when there's no parasite, uh, and partly because in invasion biology, things can move fast. So just because somebody tells you it's not there, it doesn't mean it's not there. You kind of have to confirm. Uh, so we went up to New Jersey, no parasites. Wakoit Bay, uh, just down the road from Hui, no parasites, and Great Bay in New Hampshire, also no parasites. So this is good. This is also the perils of knowing a marine biologist. It's my brother and my dad who came out and helped me sample. So thank you, dad. And my father learned an unfortunate lesson about um, uh, not putting your brand new iPhone in your pocket when you go out on the marsh because you might fall in. So I'm sorry, dad. <laughs> So this is just summing all of those data up. There's a lot of points on this, and that's because we sampled a couple times in each site, and we sampled a couple different areas in each of those estuaries. But you can see overall, the rates of parasitism were really, really low. And I should say, I realized this slide, uh, the subheading, I actually swapped those numbers, so I apologize. It's actually around 1.1%, uh, or 1.3%, rather, uh, in the native range. So very few parasites, but they're present in about 26% in the invasive range. And that ranged from place to place and time to time. In parts of Maryland, 80 to 90% of the crabs we looked at had this castrating parasite. 
Um, and one thing I should say about this parasite is that uh, as far as we know, once you're infected, you're infected for life. There doesn't seem to be a way for the crabs to clear this. Uh, it's not like recovering from a cold. So our next step was to bring this into the laboratory and ask if susceptibility is different. That's a little bit of a different question because the things going on in the environment could affect what we're seeing out in the field. So this is holding everything constant and asking, are those crabs where they have fewer parasites in the native range, have they actually evolved to resist parasitism relative to the other crabs? Um, so this is six months of my life right here. We brought all the crabs into the laboratory. Um, we kept them for three to six months to do this work because we had to wait for them to molt to expose them and we had to wait again to see if they were infected. But luckily these crabs are really tiny. So another really sophisticated piece of science equipment I brought to show you guys. Uh, every crab got their own little compartment in these parts boxes. Uh, and they also got little um, ID tags with uh, numbered and lettered and colored beads. And that was so we could track every individual. So there's a surprising amount of arts and crafts went into this project. We also kept parasites in the lab because we needed parasites to infect them with. Uh, so these came from the Chesapeake and very obediently pumped out parasite larvae in the lab every 10.4 days like clockwork. So it was very handy. And we kept the, those boxes of crabs so that we would be able to distinguish them. We called those the parasite factory. Um, so we went, we took crabs from six of those nine sites, two from each, regions, uh, each region. And within 24 hours of molting, when they're nice and soft, we, in we exposed each crab to over 100 parasite larvae. So just put it in the box with those larvae. Uh, and then we waited till they molted again to see if they were parasitized. So this is what we found, just to walk you through. Uh, those crabs in yellow are crabs that have never seen the parasite before. They're from New Jersey and New Hampshire. They're totally naive. And there, with this one exposure, we found that on the order of 60 to 70% of crabs after that one exposure were infected with the parasite, which is incredibly high, I think. Um, now, if you look at the native range, that was about half. It was about 30% of crabs. So they're still susceptible, but they're far less susceptible. So this was really interesting to me because this suggests that what I thought was going on probably really is going on, that these crabs in the native range have adapted to resist being parasitized, and these crabs that haven't seen the parasite before don't have those defenses. They haven't had time to evolve them. Uh, what was interesting to me was the invasive crabs, uh, which also showed a really low or comparatively low level of susceptibility. But I think what's actually happening there is that that's an artifact of how I got crabs for this experiment, essentially. So I was only able to do this experiment on crabs that hadn't already been parasitized. So in areas where there are a lot of parasites in the invasive range, those crabs had already had to sort of pass through a gauntlet of parasitism multiple times in order to grow up to the size that I got them and not have a parasite, if that kind of makes sense. So I think essentially the environment selected out the crabs that were really susceptible, leaving these ones that were a little bit more resistant, which I actually find, it wasn't what I was expecting, but I find it really fascinating because it suggests that those populations do have uh, some genetic variability and a possibility of adapting. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at now is trying to figure out kind of how quickly that can happen, what are the mechanisms by which that happens. Uh, and this is just showing you uh, a matchup between where we found the parasites and how, how prevalent they were and how susceptible they were. So what I'm doing now, uh, a lot of what I'm doing now is actually uh, on the genetic and the genomic level. So one of the things that I'm doing is looking simply at what genes are turned on and off in crabs that are infected versus crabs with a parasite. So trying to get at what is the parasite doing to make those male crabs maternal, right? Uh, and also looking for uh, signs of selection in the genome to see if there's genes that seem like they might be under selection in response to the parasite and see what's going on there. That is all, all ongoing. <laughs> so to kind of wrap up, uh, species invasions are increasing. We're getting better at moving things around the world as people. And as we move those things around, as we have better ships, as we have better uh, airplanes um, that move, you know, seaweed packing material around lobsters or whatever, we're moving a lot of things around too, and a lot of marine species uh, more than ever. And that means that parasite introductions are also more likely as we move more things around. Uh, adaptation is possible. I mean, we, we, we know this. I think uh, what I'm showing suggests that this is likely. 
but it isn't simple and it takes time. And we're still trying to figure out how fast things can adapt to these changing environments, new parasites, uh, new conditions, what have you. And finally, these marine parasite uh, introductions right now are really hard to understand and to predict because we don't really know that much about them. Uh, parasites in general are really understudied unless they sort of infect humans or something that we care a lot about. Uh, so this is an area that we still are working on. Uh, but I think it's, a, it's very interesting to understand uh, and has a lot of potential implications. One of the things that we worry about a lot um, with uh, this not this particular species, but the cousin to the species of parasite that I study, also Aloxothylacus in the same geno uh, genus. It infects blue crabs in the Gulf of Mexico. Same native range as this parasite, very closely related. And so one of the things that we've been wondering about is uh, you know, what might happen, I mean, hopefully we can prevent it, but what might happen if that parasite gets introduced to the Chesapeake Bay onto uh, the southeast? The blue crab fishery is enormous, and if it had the same trajectory as this, that could be a big problem. Uh, that's with that I'm gonna wrap up and just say thank you particularly Smithsonian and Huey funded this work uh, Darren and Connor my interns deserve another uh, thank you for all the work that they did um, and finally all the places that we worked in this and I want to particularly plug the National Estuarine Research Reserve System uh, this just beautiful public lands around gorgeous estuaries they're open to the public and um, you should check them out they were wonderful to work in and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and if you can speak up, she'll repeat the questions so that we can hear them on social media as well. Okay, uh, yes? So the question was, given how much coastline we have, three sites in each area is not a lot of air, uh, sites, so how did I select them and how confident I, am I that those um, patterns are representative, right? Well, so first of all, these crabs actually made site selection a little bit easier. Uh, they're estuarine, so they're only in big uh, riverine kind of outflows and areas with these strong estuary situations where you have brackish water, you have the tide coming in and out. So there's a fair amount of that coastline where you either don't find them or you don't find them in high numbers. Uh, so I picked sites where they had been reported or where they seemed very likely to be. Uh, and particularly if there was any history of the parasite, sites where I knew that the parasite had been and I knew when the parasite got there. Um, in terms of representativeness, uh, it's, it's always hard to be sure, but um, I have run statistics on this and it is, significant, uh, it is statistically sound, although there is a lot of variation. Overall, prevalence is higher. I also did a meta-analysis and pulled all the data that anybody has recorded in both the hosts from these parasites, um, and that also is robust, so we find always more parasites in the invasive range than the native range in both of these species by a factor of a lot, like a 20 to 40, I think. Um, in terms of susceptibility, we're actually doing some more experiments. I feel pretty confident about that, but I would love to have more sites. It's just a really time-consuming thing um, to do, unfortunately. Uh, but one of the things that makes me feel a little better about that is that we do have the two sites in each region, and we are seeing very similar patterns, even though those estuaries are all very distinct. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Mm. Where? Uh. Oh, yes? Uh, so they're, they're done, they're not reproducing anymore. Uh, one of the things we're working on, I'm working on with collaborators, with a large data set from the Chesapeake Bay, is we're trying to work out um, how the parasites affecting crab populations overall. Uh, it's, there's a, a weak pattern, but it's a bit hard with my data because it's from so many different places, uh, and there's so many other environmental factors, but we're seeing a really strong trend where uh, when you have a lot of parasites, you have very few crabs and you have very few young crabs because you don't have a lot of reproduction in those populations. And so we're trying to use this other data set to look at how robust that is over time. Um, but 
we're thinking that it is uh, having a pretty big impact on the crab populations. Um, there's the, the other host species of crab. There was a study that was done uh, down in Florida. They weren't specifically looking at that species. They were just generally looking at all the things that were living in these sort of oyster reefs. And they incidentally happened to be surveying for 10 years around when the parasite was introduced. And they saw that the incidence of this host crab kind of went from pretty high, pretty high, pretty high, and just crashed. Uh, the crab wasn't gone, but the, the hosts, uh, the crabs really, um, uh, the population really went down and didn't recover, uh, coincident with that parasite coming in. Uh, Autumn, got a, oh. And um, we've got a question from Facebook. Oh. Question from Facebook and from Neil. I'd like to know uh, what is it that makes certain crabs resistant to parasites? Uh, so the answer to that is that I don't know. I'm looking for it. I want to try and find it. I want to see if there's something going on uh, in the genomes that helps make them resistant. Um, it's actually a really interesting kind of area of evolutionary biology is looking at how hosts and parasites evolve in response to each other. So um, there's this idea of a they, the, the, the terminology is great. There's this idea of a co-evolutionary arms race is what it's called where your, your parasite evolves to infect your crab, your crab evolves to resist the parasite, parasite evolves to get around the defenses, your crab evolves to resist the new defenses, and you go on and on and on like this. And the idea is that eventually you get to an equilibrium. So everybody is constantly evolving a little bit in response to the other, but you hit a point where everything's pretty stable. The parasite can infect enough crabs that it can continue its population, but not so many that it takes out the crab. Because of course, it's not great for the parasite to take out its host population. Um, and that's, that equilibrium is called the Red Queen hypothesis uh, from Alice in Wonderland, where you're running as fast as you can just to stay in place. Uh, so that's part of how we're thinking about this. And that's one of the things that I'm very interested in looking at with um, uh, with the genetic data is to see if we can find some real genetic evidence that they may have been adapting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, oh, in yellow, I think. What was the most surprising thing about this research project? Um, a lot of things, but m maybe the one that I found the, just the most uh, unexpected was uh, we, we, we might have found a new parasite species. Uh, one of my interns that I showed you had a little side project, uh, and he was looking at other parasites in these crabs, and he found a parasitic isopod. So this is also like a close relative of those roly-poly bugs, uh, but it is like even more highly derived than the the, these barnacle parasites, it basically, you in the middle of the crab's body is this thing that takes up about a quarter of the body cavity. And it looks like a big ball of snot, mostly. Um, that's the female parasite. She's mostly ovary. And, uh, and the males are these teeny little guys. You can kind of see them hiding in the folds of the female. Um, and it's, it's a crustacean parasite that we found in these crabs that we weren't expecting to find. And we're in the process of trying to, uh, working with some, some folks who actually do species descriptions to try to figure out if it's a, if it's a brand new species. Uh, so that was the thing that ex it, it probably surprised me the most. Um, although I guess it shouldn't have because we just don't know that much about the parasites in these guys. Uh, but the other thing that was really interesting is I sometimes found crabs that had both the rhizocephalin, this barnacle parasite, and this isopod parasite. So there you have your thumbnail crab that's at least three different species of crustacean. Um, yeah. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> The, barnac oh, the question is the barnacle, the parasite that's native to the Gulf, is that found in any other parts of the world? It isn't, uh, not yet, but the crab itself is actually an invasive species in other places. So this is its native range. It has successfully invaded a whole bunch of Europe, Japan, the West Coast, uh, Central America, Brazil. So uh, that's another reason where I'm very interested in uh, this system is this kind of strange situation where the crab is 
the native species in this system, but it's an invasive species in other ecosystems. And we're quite interested in that and the role that maybe leaving parasites behind might play in its success. We have a few more from... Uh, We've got a question from Instagram. And they said, hello from Germany. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your favorite place to do your sampling? What place did you enjoy the most oh and my, why? Oh my gosh. I actually, uh, I actually really, I really enjoyed everywhere. I got to, whoops, uh, I got to see some beautiful, let's see, I got to see some really beautiful estuaries. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the place that I would most like to go back to. Well, I think the most interesting place for me was Louisiana. Uh, so it was a really interesting part of Louisiana. I'd never been to the state before, and basically where we were was if you go to New Orleans, and then you drive south, and then about an hour and a half later, you run out of land, and five minutes before you run out of land, that's where I was working. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm not sure if this is still, uh, the, the mic is still good, but is it good? Yep. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so that, that was probably the most interesting. It's just culturally very different than anything that I'd ever seen before. Um, it took me a while. I, if anyone's from Louisiana, you can correct my pronunciation on Poinachan. It took me a long time to get it even that good, um, and I'm sure it's not perfect. So that was probably my favorite place in terms of just, uh, just being a totally fascinating place I'd never seen before. Mm. Uh, <laughs> okay, two questions. Um, well, the, the, the first was when uh, the parasite infects the crab, does it affect the crab's lifespan? Uh, and the second was how many alligators did I see? That one's easier. I saw um, two, well, actually, that's not as easy. I saw only like two adults and maybe four babies when we were doing field work, but um, one of the guys at Fish and Wildlife in, uh, in Louisiana actually took me out on the boat and uh, we saw a whole bunch of alligators, and he told me that apparently a small alligator that you can deal with yourself, uh, as far as he's concerned, is like five feet or less. Um, I'm 5'2", so I think my threshold is a lot lower than that. <laughs> uh, and in, in question of the crab lifespan, um, we're not quite sure. We think it might uh, decrease the lifespan a little bit. It does change their behavior a little bit um, in terms of how often they hide and that kind of thing. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, but one thing that the, the parasite does do is it changes the way the crab molts. So the parasite has a lot of control over the molting cycle. So the crab, after the parasite emerges, it's really disruptive to the parasite, that internal external connection if the crab molts again. And so it stops molting. Uh, and it will eventually molt again because that externa on the crab, uh, eventually it sort of reaches the end of its lifespan or if something happens to it, because stuff just gets beat up um, out in the ocean. Um, it'll kind of shrivel up and then the crab will molt again. And then a little, uh, you'll see another little parasite that, par or the parasite will um, make a new sac. So one of my interns was actually looking at that. He took some crabs and he sniffed off the externe just to see is there, you know, if you give it a little help, if you traumatize the parasite, can the crab clear the infection? Uh, and most of the crabs unfortunately died, which we, we, you know, we're not too surprised by because I think having something dying in your body like that is probably tra traumatizing, but one crab survived. And we were very excited about this crab and we kept waiting and waiting. We called it Lazarus. We kept waiting and waiting for this guy to, to molt and waiting and waiting. And it molted months and months later, and we were like, you did it, buddy, you did it. Um, and it had a little parasite externa, so the parasite was in there just biding its time. Um, and so I think probably the molting control may have something to do with lifespan too, because if a crab gets beat up and stuff grows on it or something, it's not, um, it's not able to uh, clear that as often. So the crabs that we had that were infected in the lab, they got pretty nasty looking. Um, because they, they weren't molting on cycle. So. Mm. Um. Is there a question? Mm. How did you get into uh, I, I actually have a background in genetics. So I've done quite a lot of uh, things that were not marine before I came to a marine perspective. Um, I did uh, undergraduate, I did uh, 
tuberculosis research in humans. Uh, I did a master's degree in bird conservation genetics in New Zealand. And that's actually where I got introduced to invasive species uh, because New Zealand has these incredible endemic birds that have just been destroyed by invasive species. Um, and so that kind of led me to an interest in looking at invasive species, looking at how they adapt and how species respond to them. Um, and I just kind of lit upon crabs, mostly invasive crabs, green crabs were the first thing that I studied in this kind of area and still a major thing that I research. And they're just so fascinating. They're so interesting. And how this happens in the marine world is just nowhere near as studied as how, how this kind of processes happen uh, on land. And so that kind of got me into it. And um, I did a marine, I was in a marine station for my PhD. And I realized at that point that uh, I also traveled around to several marine stations to do my work. And I realized that marine stations are always uh, by the ocean in beautiful places. And so I figured that marine biology seemed like an excellent career choice. <laughs> and I have not regretted it. It's, uh, it's been really wonderful. <laughs> Can you remind our users online the, the names of the crabs that you were working with? Mm -hmm. And also, do you have any species that are of particular interest in the future or that you could or would suggest to other researchers uh, to look into? Uh, so the, the species I was looking at, the parasite is Loxothylacus panopii, and the crab is Rithropanopius harrisi. Uh, it also infects another species, Panopius depressus, um, which is a side note I think is a really, I, I feel so sad for that poor crab because its 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 species name is Depressus, and that's because the back of the crab is actually kind of flat; it's not bumped out. Uh, but it's sometimes called the depressed mud crab, which is just like, come on, it, ah, that seems mean. Um, other other species that I work with, uh, I work a lot with green crabs, which a lot of people around here are probably familiar with. Uh, it's a major invasive species. Um, the Asian shore crab is now coming in. I work with that. I've actually, since coming to Hui, I've gotten to do uh, some research that's been really, really fun on those uh, hydrothermal vent crabs. So actually going down in Alvin, and like I, I had Alvin trapping crabs for me, which was just incredible, um, and bringing some of these crabs up and running experiments on the ship to see how they adapt on really short time scales to these uh, very variable environments that they ha see at hydrothermal vents. Um, I guess in terms of, of what other people should research. I mean, obviously, whatever they want to. But um, I think that there, there's so much that we don't know about, particularly marine parasites, that we could always use more people in that field, um, and particularly more people doing taxonomy, which is uh, not, not a really glamorous side of biology, necessarily. That's the, those are the biologists who describe species, who can actually say, this is a new species. This is its name. This is what it looks like. This is how you can tell what it is. Um, we can't all do that. I can't do that. I do genetics, so I don't have the skill set to like, to you know, to draw the particular defining features of things. Uh, and that's something that we run into a lot: is that um, there are way more new species that have been discovered than we can even describe. So that that's an area that I, I wish we had more folks uh, working in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the question is, has the, the parasitism status, does that affect any predator-prey interactions of the stuff that eats the crabs? Um, so I, I believe it does to an extent. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head which direction this went, but I know there was a study that looked at predation, and I cannot remember if they were more or l less likely to be eaten if they were parasitized, but it did go in one direction, and that was because of the time that they spent hiding versus out in the open. Um, so in that direct effect, I think in an indirect effect, if, they are these, if there are these big effects on population sizes, I have to imagine that's having some kind of a ripple effect if the parasitized populations just have fewer crabs. Um, but that isn't something that we've been able to look into yet. But we're very interested because it seems like it should have some impact uh, further up the food web. Mm -hmm. I have one last question. Okay. Have you seen any other parasites that exhibit this body snatching behavior? 
And then I think the question that we're all wondering here, is there a possibility that one of these parasites can infect humans, especially the males are wondering this. <laughs> um, we start to see our men turn into women. <laughs> no, so these parasites, are they're very picky. They do not want you, they're not interested in us. Uh, they, they actually really only, each species of parasite is pretty specific to one or just a small number of uh, species of crabs or lobsters or shrimps even, they don't transfer too much. Um, so, so don't worry, and, and they're crustaceans, they're barnacles, people eat barnacles. If someone were to eat an infected crab, it's just more protein, so it's fine. Really not gonna be, I know it sounds gross, it's not a problem, it's, I, I promise you they're not gonna come after you. Um, in terms of other species, uh, there are a lot of other species like this. The only other one that I've seen personally is um, there's a version of this parasite in Europe that infects green crabs. Uh, and I have seen that uh, working in Europe. There was some interesting work uh, that a, a collaborator of mine actually did some years ago because there's this idea uh, that was popular for a while of biocontrol. So you might think if you have a parasite that is quite specific about what it likes to infect and it castrates things or potentially kills them in the case of other types of parasites, maybe you introduce the parasite to some introduced populations of these hosts. So they were talking, and, and then maybe the parasite just kind of takes care of your in invasive species problem for you. Uh, that, that's the idea. Uh, so on the west coast, green crabs are invasive, and there was a vogue a while ago that maybe we can introduce this body snatching parasite, take care of our green crabs. Uh, so my colleague did some research and found that, because you always, you don't want to introduce anything without knowing what the potential consequences are. We have several horror stories of things that uh, have not been well thought out and have not gone well. Uh, so he took native species on the west coast and uh, exposed them to the parasite to see if the parasite could infect them. And what he found with that study was it couldn't uh, infect them successfully, but it could try and it could kill them in the process. So the, uh, the decision was that that was not a good way to go. Um, so that's just, a, I don't know, kind of a tangent, but uh, I've always thought that that was kind of fascinating and an interesting cautionary tale on um, it sounds like such a great idea to do biocontrol, but you, it's very hard to know how that's actually gonna work out. Um, Any more questions? Well, thank you so much, Carolyn. We appreciate thank you Christ. being here tonight. And thank you everybody for coming out. Several of us will be here afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you. Actually.